Hello, uh, my name is Sean Jeansgale. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy at the Rail Passenger, Associ Rail Passengers Association. Uh, and it is March, which means it is time to get ready for Rail Passengers Day on the Hill, uh, Rail Nation DC, and an entire month of advocacy. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to launch uh, this 118th Congre Congressional Overview uh, with a focus on passenger rail policy issues. Okay, so beginning at the beginning, uh, we are coming off of a midterm election year and we have seen um, a change uh, of control of the US House of Representatives. So the GOP took the House uh, with a razor thin majority that's 222 Republicans to 212 Democrats, as we all saw in January um, during the election of House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy from California. It is a somewhat fractious GOP caucus, um, and there is some, some questions about um, what kind of uh, unified front they will be able to present over the course of the 118th Congress. Um, meanwhile, on the Senate side, Dems beat the odd, uh, the midterm odds to retain the Senate, again, with a razor thin majority. We see 51 Democrats to 48 Republicans as they caucus. Those are, there are three independents, um, which include Senators uh, Sanders, King and of course, and the new independent uh, Senator, um, Senator Sinema from Arizona. Uh, again, they'll be caucusing with the Democrats, which means the Dems retain control of um, all the committee chairs and they will be able to pass, uh, you know, essential legislation. However, again, there's some questions about whether Senator Schumer uh, how much control he has over the Democratic caucus for more controversial uh, pieces of legislation, which we will talk about shortly. Um, so these narrow mar margins mean big problems for the FY24 budget and the entire budgeting process, which includes having to raise uh, the debt ceiling this summer. We, we are going to hit it sometime, according to the Congressional Budget Office uh, projections, between July and September. Um, that would instigate, the failure to raise it would instigate a government shutdown and, and I think uh, fairly a self-inflicted crisis. Um, I, I'm focusing on passenger rail policy, so I'm not going to touch on the, the broader issues here, but it's important to know because A, if the government shut down, shuts down, uh, we lose funding for Amtrak, we lose funding for transit, transit agencies, uh, the FRA shuts down. It's also just going to chew up a lot of the legislative calendar. And so some of the things we would like to do um, regarding uh, regarding the budgeting process, talking with new members of Congress about the importance of Amtrak, uh, talking to members of the Appropriations Committee about why passenger rail um, is essential to the communities it serves. Uh, it's gonna be sh shunted off to the side a little bit while we deal with this meta crisis. Um, I think the private sector is publicly expressing confidence that a deal will be struck. I agree with that. However, the problem is this is not the most functional leg legislative body in the world, and they work best when they're facing deadlines. So without that kind of overt public pressure, uh, overt pressure from the private sector to, to come up with a deal, um, we, we may see this thing go down to the wire. And, and again, that's just going to consume a lot of oxygen uh, as we get closer to that deadline. Um, and there's there's kind of that political horse horse race uh, coverage of who's to blame for the default. So uh, we will see. But again, as always, educating new members, of which there are many in this Congress, on why Amtrak and passenger rail and transit uh, is a top priority. Uh, is, is, is a central service that's going to be a top priority for our organization. 
We're seeing some churn uh, at the top spots in the Appropriations Committee. Um, Senator Patty Murray will be replacing uh, the retiring Senator Leahy from Vermont as head of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Senator Susan Collins is taking a step up from T. HUD ranking member to full committee ranking member, uh, replacing the retiring Shelby uh, from Alabama. Senator Schatz will continue his role heading up the Transportation and Housing Subcommittee. Um, and we'll see a new face with Senator Cindy Hyde Smith from Mississippi. Uh, so we'll have to see. Senator Collins was a, is a long time uh, friend of, of Amtrak and Down Easter. It's good to see her take over. Um, that top spot, uh, but we will we will see what Senator Hyde Smith uh, what her priorities are uh, during this this cycle. On the House side, there's a lot of new faces as well. Um, Representative Granger will take over as chair of uh, the Appropriations, swapping spots with uh, ranking member now ranking member Delora, uh, and we're going to see some some new faces on the Transportation and Housing Subcommittee chair. So Representative Tom Cole from Oklahoma is going to take over uh, as the top, top spot on the Transportation Subcommittee. And Representative Mike Quigley from Illinois um, is going to replace uh, the retiring Representative Price from North Carolina as the, as the top dem on the Transportation Subcommittee. So again, it's going to be trying to, trying to figure out what their priorities are um, and how how these negotiations fit into the larger budgetary debate. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of pressure to to cut um, to cut discretionary spending. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure, I think, to uh, especially with the debt limit to to figure out what programs are are going to get flatlined and what programs are going to get cut. There's going to be some real divisions between the the Senate and the House on that. And one of the concessions that um, Majority Leader McCarthy made to get elected was he really opened up the process for amendments on the floor. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, we return to um, a scenario where, where some backbench member uh, maybe takes a pot shot at Amtrak, maybe takes a pot shot at some of the long distance routes um, we've done a really good job of bolstering our support in the Senate, and we're going to have to rebuild some of that support in the uh, among the House GOP caucus. Uh, so there's a lot of new members there, and we're already reaching out to them. But again, this is why we we're counting on our members and our council members to take part in in our March advocacy month. Uh, so the president is supposed to submit budget to Congress by the first Monday in February every year. We've blown by that deadline. It's not unusual. Last year's budget was released March 28th. Um, I'm hoping we don't see it go that late this month um, because that is the literal, March 28th is our day on the hill. And, and that would be a little difficult to, to incorporate um, the budget request on that short of notice. Uh, so, Amtrak waits for the White House to release its budget um, proposal before releasing their legislative grant request. So we will be waiting. We, we are in contact with Amtrak to try to uh, align, uh, better understand their needs. Um, we're also very excited because Amtrak successfully lobbied Congress during the last appropriation cycle to be added uh, with the USDOT um, in, in coming up with drafting the, the detailed spend plan for the dedicated uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funding for the Northeast Corridor and National Network. So Amtrak's getting about $4.5 billion a year in dedicated funding um, to the Northeast Corridor, to the National Network, and uh, the you originally the legislation called for the USDOT to include that detailed spend plan as part of the president's budget. Um, now Amtrak made the case, you know, it's our railroad, we, we have a better sense of, of 
how we should be spending it. So we should, we should draft this together. So I would expect that to be either part of the president's budget request or Amtrak's legislative grant request. Either way, we're going to find out uh, a lot more information in the coming weeks about how this money is going to be spent during the, the kind of the first tranche of investment. Another thing to keep an eye on, uh, I predict both Amtrak and transit operators will continue to include uh, elevated requests for operating funding um, to help them cover up ridership losses resulting from the pandemic. Uh, we are moving back to normal um, in certain business lines, uh, certain sectors of the transportation market, vacations have obviously Vacation travel has returned a lot quicker than business travel. Uh, transit operators specifically are, are really struggling with work from home uh, and what that is doing to their, um, their ticket revenue from commuters. Uh, so I, I would expect to see them come to Congress and say, we, we need a little bit of a lifeline here while we continue to figure out what the new normal is and, and change the way we provide service uh, so that people will will take the trends and it's not going to be you know morning peak rush hour commutes um, that are they're going to be driving this in the same way as in the past so i would hope we would go towards a, a more regional rail model um, something to keep an eye on i, I also think we're going to have to make the case that uh, to, to especially new members of congress even though there's all this dedicated funding for capital programs for Amtrak and for inner city passenger rail competitive grants uh, directed at states, we still need operating funding for Amtrak because not only does that keep the trains running, but it helps Amtrak staff up, bring on the engineering uh, and project management expertise it needs to spend the money effectively. Um, that is, in fact, one of the things we've seen uh, as a driver in project costs in the U.S. is uh, outsourcing those those tasks uh, tasks to uh, contractors to to uh, management firms, and and I think we can really build a better Amtrak. Um, as a result of the BIL, that will be a very important part of, of creating sustainable rail operations and a sustainable rail expansion program. Moving to the Transportation Committee side of the ledger, um, Senator Cantwell will continue to head up Senate Commerce. Uh, Senator Wicker has moved to Armed Services, which means Senator Cruz will take over as ranking member. Uh, Senator Wicker and Senator Cantwell had a really good working relationship. We are going to see um, whether Senator Cruz can uh, kind of recreate that chemistry. He's a little bit known as more of a, a firebrand. Um, so, however, you know, transportation committees are generally where uh, bipartisanship has, has proved more, most resilient. So, Exciting things uh, we will see. Senator Peters and Senator Young will be the uh, chair and ranking member, respectively, for the Surface Transportation Subcommittee. Uh, on the House side, the gavel has changed to Representative Graves, who will chair the full committee, um, and Representative Nels, who will chair the Rail Subcommittee. Uh, we haven't Graves is is you know steady hand. He's expressed a lot of um, interest in developing a sense of bipartisan comedy, and and so we are optimistic about uh, that direction based on the comments uh, Chairman Graves has made. Representative Nels is a little bit more of a unknown quantity on the rail side. He is um, kind of caused some waves with a. Um, an interview with Bloomberg government uh, where he expressed uh, uncertainty about the value of Amtrak. He said it seems like a little bit of a, a persistent loser uh, from a money-making perspective. Um, and 
we're going to have to push back against that. We, we, we definitely believe that oversight is, is welcome, uh, given all the new funding that is being directed to Amtrak. We want to make sure it's meaningful oversight, and, and certainly we don't want to relitigate, you know, does Amtrak need to exist? Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, again, but that's why we need uh, our members, our council members, and, and passengers generally to, to, to engage in this process. Um, Representative Rick Larson will take over the ranking member position, um, taking the top dem Democratic spot from the retiring Peter DeFazio. I think that choice uh, um, has to do with the fact that Washington State, uh, Representative Larson is from Washington State, which has a very strong aviation industry. And the big to do item for the transportation committees is federal aviation administration reauthorization um that that's uh it expires at the end of september i believe and the moment that expires you start you stop losing you lose the ability to uh to take tax ticket taxes from airline tickets and so the moment you blow past that deadline you're you're blowing a hole in your budget um you're gonna have to backfill that with with general funds so given i, I would expect that to chew up a lot of the calendar uh, i think there's going to be differing visions between senate democrats and house gop on what an faa an optimal faa reauthorization looks like um which is all to say i i doubt we'll see a lot of passenger rail policy moving through the committee. Um, I would have said we were not going to see much of any rail legislation moving through the committee, given where we are in the surface transportation reauthorization. We're, we're only two years into a five-year bill. Uh, we just passed it in 2021. We have uh, a pretty decent runway, so to speak, uh, ahead of us. So it's really, I think the committees are going to be, I would have predicted the committees would have been more, more focused on implementation rather than coming up with, you know, innovative and new uh, rail policy proposals. However, um, the Norfolk Southern derailment in Ohio is having uh, quite the impact on the national conversation about freight railroads and the role they play in the US transportation system. Um, we've seen a bipartisan group of senators introduce uh, the Railway Safety Act earlier this week. Um, that's Senators Brown, Vance, Casey, Rubio, Fetterman, and Hawley. That's a very disparate group of, of senators. And the fact that that coalition has, has uh, coalesced around this issue is very interesting to me. Uh, the bill would mandate two-person crews, uh, which was very con controversial when the FRA proposed uh, issued a proposed rulemaking last year. Um, it would also increase penalties for mis corporate misconduct, as well as change FRA oversight and uh, freight railroad reporting requirements. Uh, we saw a a much more narrow bill proposed in the House with uh, Democratic representatives Deluzio and Kana who introduced the derail act that simply changes reporting rules for derailments of tih um tih cargo uh so you know whether this is a potential vehicle for passenger rail policies remains an open question uh, I, I we're very interested uh in some changes to the Amtrak board, to transparency, given all the increased funding that is flowing to Amtrak. We, we think um, there's certainly room for improvement there. However, given this kind of tenuous bipartisan co coalition, um, there may be resistance to expanding the scope of the legislation. We've also seen uh, Chairman Graves kind of tap the brakes a little bit and say, you know, we want to wait for the NTSB, uh, the National Transportation Safety Board to issue their report following the NS derailment um, before we take any action. I think there's there's going to be certainly 
some reaction from uh, the class ones and their lobbyists, um, quite a powerful group in DC. But, you know, we are seeing some interesting, um, some interesting coalitional coalitions forming. Uh, freight railroads have been quite um, dismissive of Amtrak and Amtrak passengers' complaints over the last decade. Um, but now that we are seeing a uh, crisis in the rail shipping community uh, with communities who are uh, trackside, uh, located alongside the freight right, uh, rights of way, I think we could see the stars aligning for, for some, some meaningful regulation. And, and certainly by applying pressure, um, I think we're going to have increased leverage on the passenger side to see them live up to their statutory obligations for priority dispatching, uh, as well as, you know, some, some cert, uh, a few STB cases that are moving both on, uh, with Amtrak versus UP on the Sunset Limited, but also potentially new, new routes and, and how, uh, what kind of access Amtrak gets to freight rights of way. So all very interesting, very promising, something to keep an eye on. Normally, um, I've talked a little bit about the dysfunction, uh, especially around the debt limit that is going to eat up a lot of the congressional calendar. That's That can be kind of depressing from a federal government affairs perspective. However, with the passage of the BIL um, and the five years in dedicated funding for inner city passenger rail programs, um, we've seen the action move to the states and there's this whole separate uh, separate to-do list for our organization, for, for every passenger rail organization, um, in implementing and standing up all these exciting new passenger rail programs. So I created this little Gantt chart um, to kind of show you how many things are, are moving, how many plates the Federal Railroad Administration has to keep spinning right now. One of the big ones is the Quarter Identification Selection Program. Um, there was an initial kind of expression of interest uh, that was due summer 2022. Now we've moved to more of a in-depth service development program, uh, sorry, service development plan. And the applications uh, to be part of that corridor ID and selection program are due March 27th, at which point the FRA will have a pretty quick turnaround time um, because by law, they are supposed to come up with that first corridor ID pipeline list by May 2023. We'll see if we hit that, they hit that mark. It's quite ambitious, but I think it's going to really provide a, a blueprint for how a lot of this money is going to be spent. We've also seen the Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail, um, both for National Network and Northeast Corridor. Um, really beefed up through the BIL um, and, and guaranteed funding is always a great thing, but we've, we've even seen some, some authorized funds from appropriations committee. So 4.54 billion is available for national network. Uh, it's in the NOFO notice of funding opportunity phase right now. Um, the applications are due April 21st, at which point the FRA will take those applications, consider them. Um, I, they'll have to, I think, integrate that with that corridor ID selection program work. Uh, there's no real deadline that I'm aware of for them to come back and uh, issue those awards, but I tentatively set that date for November based on past experiences with these kinds of grant programs. Um, we're going to work with the FRA and see if there's a more concrete timeline. Uh, meanwhile, the, those Fed Estate Partnership for Northeast Quarter, there's almost $9 billion available, um, and applications are due March 27th. There's a lot more of a defined world of, of projects, I think, on the Northeast Quarter, so there'll be less of a surprise uh, when, when those lists are reported. We're going to see, you know, the, the BMP tunnel, we're gonna see 
Hudson, uh, Hudson tunnels, the gateway programs, portal bridge, all these things are going to be um, part of the mix there. Restoration enhancement grants. Uh, there's been no funding appropriated for this program and there's no guaranteed funding. So at the moment, it's, it's a bit, um, it's, it's going a little fallow. There are some set-asides within the Amtrak grants. So um, we'll see if FRA chooses to, to use that flex funding option. Inner city rail compact grants that that provides matching funding for regional rail authorities. Um, I think the Congress had in mind the Southern Rail Commission as, as, a, as a model there. It's an open application process. Um, there, there is money and, and I, I would expect someone at some point to take advantage of that. Uh, we'll see who it is. Um, I wouldn't. I'm not gonna. I'm not a betting man. So, um, but but I would expect someone out west to, to take advantage of that. So the Amtrak North National Network, sorry, Amtrak National Network Grant Corridor set asides and the Amtrak Northeast Corridor Grant set asides. This is money that goes directly to Amtrak for them to use um, as on state of good repair projects, fleet replacement. Uh, station upgrades as they see fit. As I mentioned in, in a previous slide, Amtrak needs to report on that as part of the um, presidential budget request and their legislative grant. So I'd expect any week now we're going to see more about how they use that money, which amounts to about, I, I don't want to say four and a half billion a year um, between the two accounts. The finally, the FRA long distance restoration study that is ongoing. Um, we're going to, we took part in all the regional meetings, our staff members, um, and we solicited feedback from, from council members and from, from uh, general, general passengers and supporters and, and, you know, represented your point of view in that um, the Final report is due November, and um, they had two years to do it. They didn't really get it going until about a year into a year after the BIO was passed. So we're, we're on a bit of a condensed timeline. I'm going to take a moment to talk more about that long distance study since I think it's going to be interesting. Although I will say uh, we are going to hear directly from the FRA long distance study leads um, as part of Rail Nation DC. So I would very much encourage you to register for that if you have any interest in what is going on with that program. Uh, and if you wanna hear it directly from the horse's mouth and, and provide input directly, um, whether you're, you're there in person or, or um, as, as a Zoom participant, uh, it's gonna be a great session and that'll be March 27th, Monday. So um, very excited to hear more from them. And I think we're gonna hear about the, the next phase. So it's important, I think, to understand the way the long distance study and the corridor ID studies interface and overlap and, and where they don't. So corridor ID, that's really targeted towards the state supported in Northeast Corridor. Um, as well as the restoration of exist uh, service that used to be run by Amtrak long distance uh, and, and upgrades to existing long distance frequencies. Um, so I think people have really focused in on, especially Amtrak has focused in on a lot of that shorter than 750 miles and, and going directly to the States. Um, but it is important to note that the corridor ID program um, will include restored long distance services uh, that used to be operated by Amtrak and increased frequencies, whether that's a daily sunset, a daily cardinal, or, or maybe something like a, um, a second daily frequency on uh, between Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Chicago, uh, which has been in, in development for a while. What the core ID doesn't address, um, 
according to the FRA's interpretation of the law, is new Amtrak long distance routes. Um, so routes that were operated by some uh, railroad other than Amtrak or a new alignment. Um, you know, I think there's, we're still waiting to hear more details on this. You know, uh, one of the big, big routes we want to push is Chicago, Atlanta, Miami. And that is close to, um, that's close to an Amtrak route that was discontinued, but, but not quite. And so, you know, does that, does that fit within, uh, under the umbrella of core ID, which would um, give it access to federal state, uh, federal state program grant money, TBD. Um, again, we'll, we'll hear more from the FRA on that uh, later this month. Um, without going into too many details of, about the presentation they gave, um, I did want to include this map, which I think many of our members and many passengers will be interested in. Uh, it gives you kind of the broad overview of the, the distance routes that they are uh, looking at. Again, this is not comprehensive. They're, they're looking at potentially new routes. Um, I think they're looking at, you know, one of the ones that came up a lot was the Interstate 20 uh, long distance corridor between Fort Worth, Dallas, and Atlanta um, that the I-20 corridor commission is, is, is working on. Um, and we certainly support their efforts. So, but it, it does give you, I think, a, a pretty good sense of the universe of possibilities. Um, there's going to be a lot of analysis that goes into current, the current travel market. You know, we're almost 50, we're 50 years on from 1971 when, when Amtrak was founded. Uh, which is when a lot of these lines were, were drawn on the map. Um, and, and so it's, it's important that we update our priors. That being said, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of room for community input, and that is why we are encouraging our members to go to the FRA Long Distance Study website, um, which I'll show you at the end of this presentation, uh, to, kind of, to, to provide input. Um, it also is going to require a lot of organizing uh, with, with mayors and state representatives, state senators along that, uh, governors, of course, uh, along the potential long distance routes. And so that's, that's gonna be, I think, one of the big things that we do this summer is, is help our members and help uh, local groups um, do that kind of organizing work to, to stand up and say, we need to be included in the final study. You can see here the regional working groups, how they're broken out. Again, RPA staff members were at every one of these meetings, which happened all, all across the country, uh, all, all throughout February. Um, some really interesting things. If you go to the fralongdistancestudy.org, you can see all the meeting materials, um, which, which will help you under, better understand what was discussed, what goes into the process, um, and what the final report's gonna look like. I've also included the contact form uh, that is at fralongdistancerailstudy.org at the bottom. Uh, and I encourage you, um, if you feel like you have something to add to this conversation, you can go there and, and add your comment now. We're also working with the FRA uh, study team on how to um, how to structure some of this feedback. So you know, stay tuned, and we'll we'll make sure that uh, if there is a, uh, a very specific opportunity for our members um, to solicit feedback, uh, we'll let you know about it. But I think the, again, the first step is to register for the meeting so that you can hear directly from the study team. Um, on March 27th. So uh, there was a lot I went through. It, a lot of that was very general. We're gonna follow up later uh, next week with some very some specific uh, Amtrak policy requests, um, some specific policy uh, to do lists around transit and around the implementation of these new BIL programs. In the meantime. If you have any questions, reach out to me at genesgale at narprl.org. Happy to answer 
any questions you have, and if you have any, uh, if you want to take part in our day on the hill, um, either remotely or in person, uh, fire me a line and I'll make sure we, we add you. Um, thank you for your time. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Bye.